I want this to be a fun day. It's going to be some pretty challenging content. I hope you can pinch yourself if needed to stay awake as much as possible. I think it's pretty cool content. This is supposed to be a mountaintop experience for us. You know, we have the mean value theorem as one mountaintop experience, and fundamental theorem of calculus is another mountaintop experience. I want this one to maybe even be higher, a higher mountain to climb, um, to summarize what I think are some pretty cool things uh, in trying to understand chaos under iteration and to also make use of metric spaces and topological ideas to prove things. Okay? So that's the overarching goal. Let me start by saying the references that I have made use of. I, I haven't studied this stuff in a while, so I, I needed some review myself. Uh, and some references I used was this one, first of all, mostly is an Introduction to Chaotic Dynamical Systems uh, by Robert Devaney. And I spelled the edition wrong. Probably shouldn't have noticed that, but I did. Okay. That's, a, that's the main reference I used. I also used this reference somewhat, Encounters with Chaos by Denny Malik. <coughs> and this is a symposium book that was made, Chaos and Fractals, the Mathematics Behind the Computer Graphics. Robert Devaney and Linda Keene were the editors, and there's other, there's lots of different um, papers in this book. Um, and I also made use a little bit of a paper that I uh, came upon about 25 years ago by David Terman, Chaotic Spikes Arising from a Model of Bursting and Excitable Membranes. And I made use of that actually a lot in my thesis. I'll talk a little bit about what I do for my PhD thesis as well. So my PhD thesis was not directly related to chaos, but it was sort of related to a model that's related to chaos. First of all, I have what I call a parable of chaos, the butterfly effect. If you watch the first old Jurassic Park movie, uh, they talk a little bit about chaos and the butterfly effect in that movie. There's a scene where they're in a the jeep, and I forget the names of the characters, but the guy is talking to the woman, talking about chaos and like water dropping on your hand, and which way it will go, which way it will roll off your hand. It's kind of unpredictable. That's sort of one metaphor for chaos. Another metaphor is the butterfly effect. Basically, it says small changes in initial conditions of certain nonlinear systems, like the weather, can have radical long-term effects. You ask the questions, does a flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil, or Mexico, or China, or wherever you want, set off a tornado in Texas, say, two weeks later? The butterfly effect claims that that is a possibility. Okay? Because little tiny changes in initial conditions, the butterfly sitting in the flower, Will it take off or not? If it doesn't take off, the airflow will be a certain way. And if it does take off, flapping its wings, the airflow will be a slightly different way. And that theoretically can have ripple effects that have drastic long-term changes. One person that I read about even claims that a rock rolling down a hill on Mars can affect Earth's weather three or four or five weeks later because of the tiny gravitational changes affecting the Earth's gravity, affecting the Earth's weather, okay? Can you really prove that the butterfly fly effect is real? I, I don't know that you can, though people, you, I mean, the weather is not a really a repeatable system. You can set up repeatable experiments under certain conditions, perhaps, that can test it. And I think, based on those conditions, it, it is proved in those very controlled conditions. Uh, here's a nice image from the music of Alex Thode, which I, I'm sorry, Alex Thode, I didn't actually listen to your music, I used your image. Kind of a nice image of the butterfly effect. There's the butterfly, there's the tornado in the background. I thought that was kind of a cool image. Um, so that's what I call a parable of chaos. An icon of chaos is something called the Lorentz attractor. Lorentz uh, was a meteorologist, a theoretical meteorologist, at least maybe it's better to call him a climate modeler, I'm not sure. Back in the 60s, he was investigating differential equations that modeled the weather. They're complicated, kind of complicated equations, complicated effects, and he wondered if he could see those kind of complicated effects in simpler systems. And the simpler system that he came up with was this system of 
three differential equations, ordinary differential equations and three unknowns. X, Y, and Z were all functions of time. It's actually a fairly looking, sim simple looking system. Uh, there's only a, a couple nonlinearities, and they seem like they'd be relatively tame nonlinearities. The x times z term there and the x times y term there. But even with those only slight nonlinearities, for certain values of the parameters sigma, rho, and beta, very interesting things can happen. This graph is, zoom in on that if you need to, is a graph of three-dimensional phase space, x, y, z space, solution curves of the system of differential equations move around in the space. And well, if you let time go by, I started with an initial condition down kind of low here, near the origin. Uh, you can already see these graphs, which are showing you um, x, y, and z as functions of time individually, are already looking a little strange. And you're getting some sort of oscillation around that green dot over there. You let time go by a little further, more oscillation, and you let time go further, and all of a sudden, wait a minute, now it's heading over toward that other dot, and continuing to go around it, and sometimes back to the other one, that's very kind of unpredictable and, yes, chaotic behavior. And this is called the Lorentz attractor, and it's a very fortunate accident of history that it also looks like a butterfly's wings. So, you know, Lorentz and others were very intrigued by this. It is chaotic, it is kind of unpredictable, the graphs are kind of crazy. One feature I want to show you about these graphs is that the general pattern of this thing is the same no matter what your initial condition is. And also the general pattern of the fact that it's very up and down and unpredictable for these things is going to be pretty much the same no matter what your initial conditions. But the fine detail per behavior, for example, the, like the fact that there are sort of smaller oscillations right in there, is very sensitive to initial conditions. If I change an initial condition ever so slightly, I bet those things will go away. Let me try it. I think I'd bet money on it, uh, but I won't actually bet money. So let me change z0, the initial z coordinate, ever so slightly with this slider. Watch, watch where I pointed before. Focus in on that. Ready? One, two, three, go. Yep, it went away. Ever so slight change in the initial condition for z to make it go away. Probably if I changed x and y, ever so slightly it would go away as well. Still kind of unpredictable pattern, but the fine detail changes pretty radically for even very small, arbitrarily small changes in the initial conditions. But the real life ramifications of this are that detailed long term weather forecasting is pretty much a hopeless cause. Now you can say there are going to be certain trends, for example, a simple trend is it's warmer in the summer than it is in the winter, of course, at least here in the northern hemisphere. And, well, I think they switch it around and they say like January and so forth is the summer in the southern hemisphere. Do they? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's still summer, but it's not Okay. Actually, you Anyway, um, but to say, for example, the high next June 21st is going to be 94 degrees plus or minus 2 degrees, that's, yeah, that's, stretching it. Or to say it's going to rain that day with 80% confidence, that's stretching it. You, you really can't do that because small changes can, can propagate into big changes in the long term. In my thesis, my PhD thesis, I worked on this a model of bursting and excitable membranes. Um, it's a biological model of your pancreas, actually, is the particular model I was looking at of cells called beta cells in your pancreas that produce insulin. And looking at the voltage changes across the cell membranes, if you've had a little biology, maybe you know about that to some degree or another. It's a three-dimensional system of equations where the equations are pretty complicated. Yikes, look at all these things. And they're even more complicated than, than that indicates there uh, because the these things, the m infinity, the h infinity, the w infinity, and the tau w have various formulas that is given in this crazy looking code you see. The point is not to look at the code too much, but to look at the output. <coughs> to see pretty interesting behavior. Okay, this is the phase space down here. This is 
YWV space, you can't quite see the V. Here you're seeing part of an attractor for the system that's maybe a little simpler looking than the attractor. The corresponding functions, V, W, and Y, as functions of T, are where the bursting is. You've got these periods of relatively stable behavior for the voltage across the cell membrane. And then all of a sudden, when the glucose concentration gets higher enough, actually sugar, you get spiking there, you get bursting. Um, and that, I think I read about, indicates that the cells start producing insulin. If I recall correctly, I don't know the ton of the biology. A uh, term in that paper I referred to showed that the number of spikes that you get in each burst, that number is chaotic. And I did some stuff with some topological approaches to proving certain attractors exist in this kind of system, um, is what I did as part of my thesis. And showed also there were per periodic solutions. So that's kind of an interesting example as well. By the way, if you do a PhD thesis in, in math, typically you either have to solve a problem nobody solved before, come up with a new technique that nobody's done before, and, or else come up with a new theory, which probably you're working on with other people, you're probably not doing it by yourself. Um, probably the simplest thing is to come up with a new technique, which is what I did. I sort of came up with a simpler technique for doing something in a simpler situation than somebody else's more general technique. How did you pick that one? Uh, it sort of fell in my lap with enough studying, I figured out what I could do in, in a nutshell that somebody else had, had not done before. You can't do something that somebody else has done before either. Which is kind of a shame if like you're only one month away from finishing and somebody else does it a month before you. Actually, they'll still probably give you your PhD because um, you put in all that work. But yeah, it's still kind of a shame. All right, next section is a preview of chaos. We can analyze that chaos and those other systems is kind of difficult to analyze. They're nonlinear differential equations. It's pretty difficult to analyze that, especially in three dimensions. Actually, in two dimensions, chaos can't happen. Um, mostly because the main, the, the main thing that makes them difficult is the formulas for the solutions are not possible. You can't find the formulas for the general solution in those cases. But in this particular example, the family of maps that we've looked at before, some on Monday and some back at the beginning of the semester, this logistic family, it's called, it's a family of quadratic maps. Mu is the parameter, mu is positive. We want to analyze uh, what's going to go on under iteration, is the idea here. You can make, first of all, what I, you might call a time series plot, where time is iteration. One iteration <coughs> is one unit of time. Two iterations is two units of time. Two units of time. I've shown you these plots before, I think. What's this plot? This is a plot of the sequence, xn versus n, where the sequence is defined by iteration by using Recursive formula, x sub n plus 1 equals f of x sub n. Starting here with mu equals 0, actually. So this is the 0 function. When mu is slightly positive, what happens? Oh, come on, work. There we go. Uh, not much changed. Actually, it did change a bit. It's more extreme as we go up this way. Let's go ahead and play this. Hmm, interesting behavior. What are we seeing here? From U is about 2.2. We're seeing that the iterates, the sequence generated by the recursive equation, look at the outputs here, is first 0.1, then 0.2, then about 0.35, then about 0.5, then up to close to 0.55, before maybe going down a little bit, it seems to have a limiting value close to 0.55. I increase mu a little bit more. Hmm, that's a little bit more interesting. I don't know why those red lines are not fully drawn. I think they were fully drawn when I looked at this before. It's a little bit more interesting. Now you're going up, 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 then down, up, down, up, down, up, oscillating still towards a limit, it seems. 
continue increasing mu. When you get to 3 or above, actually above 3, it doesn't settle down on a limit. It's bouncing back and forth essentially between two limit points. It's got two limit points. The limit doesn't exist. The limb sup does, and the limb int does, and they're two distinct numbers. But the limit itself doesn't exist. Um, but we are bouncing back and forth between close to two points. Those two points, which do exist as exact numbers, form what's called a two cycle, and they cycle back and forth between each other exactly. We are just approaching those two numbers here. You continue increasing mu, those two numbers get further and further apart. All of a sudden, when mu is around 3. Point, hmm, that's pretty interesting there too. 3.4 or so. Now we get um, yeah, that, that's you know, getting even more interesting. Start up here. It seems like we're bouncing back and forth perhaps with period four. One, two, three, four brings you close to where you were before. I mean, yeah, after, after two iterations, you're kind of close, but not quite as close as this one. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Seems like we're approaching some sort of four cycle, four limit points of the sequence. Four points that are, sub, are subsequential limits, limits of subsequence. You continue increasing mu, you can get even wilder behavior. Let's see, does this one have maybe eight, eight limit points? Uh, maybe, maybe right around there we've got eight limit points. Well, it's hard to tell. It is difficult to tell. I think I can tell right there. It looks like it might be period eight orbit. One, two, uh, start here. One, two, three, four. Brings you close, but not quite as close as that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is pretty close to where you started there. This is approaching a cycle of period eight. And if you keep going, you'll approach cycles of period 16, then 32, then 64, then 128. The period of the cycle you end up approaching as mu increases keeps doubling. But in the end, when mu is four, you have chaos. Actually, even when mu is less than four, you have some chaos, some Pretty unpredictable stuff, but there are patterns. Low values tend to give you low values in the next iteration. High values tend to give you low values in the next iteration. The real chaotic behavior is sort of in between. It's pretty unpredictable. How does that transition to chaos? It's called the period doubling word to chaos, actually, is what we're observing there. Uh, and the details of how that happens are pretty technical, as you can imagine. The most interesting stuff goes on between 3.4 and 3.6, actually, for me. I don't know how well we can see it here, but let's go ahead and try anyway. This is where the transition to chaos really happens. Especially as you get close to 3.6. It's, it's hard to tell, for sure. It, it's, you know, it's behaving kind of strangely, but it's hard to tell that it is a true, true transition to chaos. You can make those cobweb plots that we made before. I added a little bit more to my plot here. So we got the red graph is the graph of the logistic map. You were here starting at 1. You got the C, the starting value, 0.1. There's sort of like a black dot right about there. X is 0.1, is the X coordinate of that. I've got a green dot at the origin. The origin is a fixed point. The origin, you can see the red graph crosses the blue graph at the origin. Remember in chapter 3 about fixed points? They are where f of x equals x. Where does the red graph, the graph of f, cross the line y equals x? If I increase mu, there are all of a sudden two fixed points. <clears throat> two green dots. Um, if you do the iteration here, you can see it's a staircase up toward the other one, away from the lower fixed point in zero and 
toward the higher one here at about 0.35, that higher one is called an attracting fixed point. Zero, the lower one is called a repelling fixed point. And there's a real easy way to prove that the origin, x equals zero, is repelling and this other one is attracting. The key condition is to look at the absolute value of the derivative at the fixed point. If that is less than one, then P, the fixed point, is attracting. P is a fixed point. F of, P, F of P is P, here in what I'm, what I'm writing there. P, P is a fixed point is what that means. <coughs> F of P equals P. Look at the absolute value of the derivative at P. If it's less than 1, P is going to be attracting. It doesn't mean it attracts all points, all orbits, they're called, of points. But nearby it does, at least. If this is bigger than 1, then P is repelling. And if it equals 1, then the test gives no conclusion. It's kind of like the ratio test that way. You can see on this graph, the derivative of the red graph at 0 is bigger than 1. And the derivative of the red graph at this point is less than 1. Less than 1 in absolute value is positive. This one's tracking, that one's repelling. Let's increase mu a little bit more. We still see that seam, that one's attracting on the right. <coughs> Things get interesting once you get to three. Well, even before three, you get the bouncing back and forth behavior. It's starting to look a little bit more like a cobweb instead of just a staircase. <coughs> Less than a cobweb plot. We're still approaching the fixed point right there, going up, over, up, over, up, over, and then sort of around, and it is spiraling in, in fairly slowly toward that fixed point when mu is 2.955. When mu is exactly three, that fixed point, the, the derivative here, or, um, the red graph has a derivative at that point equal to negative one, and so that test on the board gives no information about whether it's attracting or repelling. Actually, to tell you the truth, I forget if it's attracting or repelling. It might be neither. When this equals one, kind of either thing could happen or neither. It could be attracting, it could be repelling, or even maybe neither. I don't actually remember for sure whether it's still tracking at three. My guess is yes, it is, but very slowly. But once you get past three, even by a slight amount, it's hard to tell, but that is no longer. Um, no longer attracting, it is actually repelling. If I, if I take my C to be close to that point, by changing the C here, the iterations go away from it. It's repelling. The spiraling is outward from it. Increase new even further. <coughs> that point is no longer attracting, but we do see an attracting two cycle. This box is essentially the attracting two cycle. The coordinate of that point and the coordinate of that point, coordinates and they're the same since it's y equals x, are the two points that form an attracting two cycle essentially. It's very close in approximation. But once you get close to 3.4, that two cycle actually becomes repelling and you get an attracting four cycle. We still see the two cycle here. I think now we're starting to see the four cycle. There we go, right there. See that slip in the box? Now we're seeing the attracting four cycle. Essentially, the coordinates of these four points right there, 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 and ever so slightly up this way form the four numbers approximately that form the attracting four cycle in this case. You continue further, you get an attracting eight cycle, though that's hard to tell. Lots of stuff going on here. We might even be, be, be to the attracting 32 cycle for all I can tell here. Now you see these cha the chaotic behavior. Sometimes it's not quite so chaotic. Maybe that's not quite so chaotic. More of a pattern to it. 
but sometimes, oh, there, there's another one, kind of a pattern to that one. There are sort of islands of stability, they're sometimes called, amidst the sea of chaos every once in a while. Why are we getting errors here? When mu gets past 4, and this is actually an important point for us, when mu gets past 4, the top of the parabola gets above 1. And what ends up happening is that most points, most seeds, give you iterates that actually eventually go outside of the box now. You can see this one coming around here. It's going up to the red graph, which is now outside of the box, over to the blue line, and back down this way, and going off to minus infinity, actually, now. And that's going to be an important point for us to realize that that can happen. And that's what we're actually going to analyze. We're going to analyze the chaotic behavior on what's called an invariant canter set in the situation. Uh, this kind of code solves for the fixed point. Fixed points. Can you solve for the attracting two cycle when the, two, the attracting two cycle exists? Or even period two points even when it's not attracting? Yeah, what you can do is you can look at what's called the second iterate of f. This is not a power here. It's also not a second derivative. It's called the second iterative of f. It's f composed with itself. Plug f into itself. f is quadratic. When you compose f with itself, you get a fourth degree equation, a quartic. Setting that fourth degree equation equal to x solves for not only fixed points, but also period two points. Because this is the second iterative of f, a period two point is back to itself after two iterations. x is back to x after two iterations. So this will solve for those period two points as well as the fixed points at once. And it turns out, I use Mathematica to help me solve it, that when mu is, um, well, greater than or equal to 3, this thing under the square root is going to be uh, non-negative, greater than or equal to 0, and so this will be real. And when it's strictly positive, it's going to give you those two uh, more points that are period 2 points. A bifurcation has occurred. If you took div q for me, bifurcation is a word you've heard before. Um, a change has happened, essentially. There's another reason it's called a bifurcation that I'll show you in a minute. This code here helps me solve for those things. Just, there's the fourth degree equation. I can solve for where it equals x. There you see these square root expressions. I can take the derivative of the second iteration at those points, that's what this code does, and see whether that the derivative is less than 1 in absolute value or not. The comment about fixed points being attracting or repelling can also be answered in the same kind of way with period two points. But here you look at the derivative of the second iterate, the composition, instead of the derivative of the original function. That's what I've got here, the derivative of the second iterate. Ultimately, I'm plugging in these period two points and simplifying. What do I get? I actually get a pretty, pretty simple expression in both cases, and it's the same in both cases. When is that? <laughs> equal to 1 or equal to negative 1. I use solve to solve for those. I can ignore the negative values of mu because I'm focused on mu as positive. These two values, 3 and 1 plus square root of 6, are where these um, derivatives of equal plus or minus 1. You can also look at the graph of that function to see where it equals plus or minus 1. Essentially, it's this window of mu value between 3 and right here. That's uh, 1 plus square root of 6 is about 3.45 or something. It's that window of mu values that the two cycle is attracting, actually. It doesn't exist when mu is less than 3, as are real numbers, at least. When mu is bigger than 1 plus square root of 6, this graph is below the green line, so the, actually the two cycle becomes repelling is the idea there. Anyway, Here's a brief summary of what you can find. The period two orbit cycle is, cycle means it goes back and forth. Orbit means what is the sequence itself. The period two orbit is attracting when mu is less than one plus square root of six, which is about 
repelling when mu is bigger than that, our bifurcation occurs with that value of mu. And at the next value of mu, the 1 plus square root of 6, that's where the attracting force cycle is born. When you transition from attracting to repelling, that's when the bi another bifurcation occurs in the number of periodic points. <coughs> it's also informative to graph the second, the second iterate in the same picture. So here we see not only the red graph being the quadratic function itself, but the pinkish graph, which I think is technically magenta, down here is the graph of the second iterate. They look pretty similar at first, but as mu goes up, watch this, this is pretty cool. As mu goes up, that pinkish graph gets flat, or it is a fourth degree equation after all. And all of a sudden, let's see, then it starts developing humps in it. Now all of a sudden when mu equals three and beyond, then the magenta pinkish graph crosses the blue line more, and that's where more intersections occur. That's a fixed point for the red graph. This is a fixed point for the red graph. These two points form your two cycle for the red graph. They are where the pinkish graph crosses y equals x, where the second iterate equals x in addition to the fixed points. And notice it does look like the derivative there and the derivative there are less than one in absolute value. So this should be attracting. Let's, let's do the iteration here. Let n increase. It's going away from the fixed point. The fixed point is repelling. But it's going toward the attracting two cycle. I'm glad I picked that particular value of mu there. That's a nice one to look at. So that's a nice way, nice thing to add to the graph to illustrate a two cycle. And I could add the fourth iterate graph to this to look at the attracting four cycle. It becomes kind of a mess. Actually, later on, we'll, if we have time, we'll look at, the, look at it. But I could add that to the graph as well. Turns out that if you look at the ratios of differences for in differences in mu values for when these bifurcations occur, something very interesting happens. The numbers, these ratios, approach a constant. It's called the Feigenbaum constant. It's about 4.6692, etc. I don't know if anybody's proved that's an irrational number or not. I would guess it is, but I'm not positive. Um, Feigenbaum is a person who may still be alive, for all I know. He discovered this constant in the 1970s. And um, it's more than just a constant related to this example. The thing that makes it important is it's a constant related to lots of examples where bifurcations like this occur. These period doubling kinds of things. It's called a period doubling root to chaos. That same constant in this same kind of calculation with these ratios of differences in parameter values for where the bifurcation has occurred. The distances, by the way, are getting smaller and smaller by about a factor of 1 over 4.5, 2 ninths or so, at each, as you continue increasing mu. And it is approaching a constant, and it is a universal constant. <laughs> Turns out for mu, mu greater than 3, 3.56995, approximately chaos reigns, it's for the most part, except for small islands instability. I've shown you that graph before. I'm not going to show you this one. This leads to something called a bifurcation diagram for this map. And uh, what is this picture of? Oh, well, that's the same as mu. This is the parameter axis, the mu axis. Mu is increasing from 3 to towards 4 here. This point over here on the graph is the fixed point, the x value close to 0.6 at first here, where the fixed point is occurring as mu increases. The fixed point stays one single attracting fixed point for a while, but it does increase in value slightly. Here's our first bifurcation at 3. This fixed point becomes repelling, and so you don't draw it anymore. And you get a two cycle, essentially. The, the two x values of 
this point for n value of mu is the two cycle. The fixed point is still there, but again, it's not, return, not attracting anymore. It's repellent, so you don't see it in the graph. Here's where you get the attracting four cycle. At the bottom, mu is 3.45. Attracting four cycle. The eight cycle occurs right about there, 3.55 or so. And then in rapid succession, you get an attracting 16, 32, 64, 128 cycle. Those bifurcation values have a limit point that ends up being, I think, where you end up getting chaotic behavior. And so you get sort of these things where it's real thick. Basically, the points are bouncing all over the place. Though there are some islands of stability where you see sort of these whitish areas, those are parameter values where things are more tame. Kind of wild. Nobody would have ever expected this. You'd never expected it. I'd never expected it until you learn about it that this kind of thing could happen. You can actually make a similar diagram on Mathematic. I took the time to do that. Just a little bit of code makes basically the same picture. Okay, just this much code. It's kind of cool. Right there. I will save this on Moodle, by the way, for you if you want to experiment with it yourself. The higher uh, iterates do get nasty. Here's a formula for the first four. Okay, you can see this, this one right there, that's the fourth iteration right there. Looks like a, in X, it looks like it's gonna maybe be a 12th degree equation. There's an X on the 12th there. Lots of mu's in there too. You don't wanna to try to analyze that analytically. All right, now we're going to go on to relating this to what we've been learning about. Topology, metric spaces. We're calling this section a toy model of chaos, the dynamics of the shift map in, on sigma sub 2, that space of sequences of zeros and ones. That's what sigma 2 is, remember? We talked about that before. Here's some important preliminaries. Just to quickly go over here. I gotta go quick. Or time goes by when you're giving a talk. It's really fast for me, I know not for you necessarily. Um, you got a metric space. You got a function f defined in the metric space, mapping the metric space to itself. Um, you can let this notation fk be the kth iterate. It's not the kth power, it's not the kth derivative. Actually, it's sim more similar to a power than it is to a derivative. You are doing something over and over and over k times. You are iterating f k times. k equals 0 corresponds to the identity map. That maps every point to itself. k equals 1 corresponds to f itself. And when k is bigger than 1, you get f composed with itself k times. In other words, we are really using the recursive equation k times when you define the function f k. Note that it is still a map from x to itself. Given a point in the metric space, let xk equal, oops, typo, <coughs> fk of that point, I need a zero here, the forward orbit of x0 under f is given by this set, the set of all other, it's k going from zero to infinity. Is there a backward orbit as well? Well, yeah, there is if, k is in, if f is invertible, but we're not considering that situation. I might have talked about orbits and algebraic structures. Did you talk about Does that ring a bell? Group actions. Okay, maybe you skip that. It is in your book. It is in your algebraic structures book. You can apply these ideas in, in algebraic structures, too. Um, Anyway, this is the this is the sequence, the, or the, the range of the sequence, more precisely, generated by the recursive equation. That's called the orbit. We are going to start our iteration at x0 instead of x1. That's traditional. Again, sigma 2 is the set of all sequences of zeros and ones, so you can write it that way. Technically speaking, such a sequence is really a function, but we're usually going to think of it intuitively as an infinite list. Not going to bother putting commas between these things, though I could. So this is this is not a number, by the way. 
It's a bunch of zeros and ones. It's not supposed to represent a number. It's supposed to represent a sequence of zeros and ones. Though you could, you could match it with decimals if you wanted to. You can define your metric. This is the metric I mentioned on Monday, I think. Wasn't it Monday or was it last Friday? I think it was Monday, last lecture. That's a metric on the space. It's well defined because the infinite series converges because of the comparison test. And in fact, d never gets bigger than 2. All points in the space are within 2 units of each other under this metric. Maybe not under some other metric. D is indeed a metric. Verification is relatively easy. Essentially, the ordinary triangle inequality helps you prove the triangle inequality for this metric. The shift map, what does it do? It takes a sequence and shifts everything to the left by one unit in the list after deleting the first thing, x0. So for example, if you apply sigma to this sequence, you get this sequence. This sequence does have a pattern. 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Keep adding one more 1 each time and then a 0 in between. There's a pattern for that. Um, the new sequence, I get rid of the 1 at the beginning, and 0 becomes the first term of the sequence. That's an example of how to apply the shift map to that particular example. What are some basic properties? It's on to, actually. In fact, it's 2 to 1. Every point in the space is the image of two points, one with a 0 in front and one with a 1 in front. This x1 through x, x2, x3, x4, etc., is the image under sigma of both of those points. And those would be the only two points that map to it, so it is 2 to 1. Turns out it's continuous. Time. I do have the proof of the continuity here. I think I'm not going to take the time to talk about it in detail. It's related to a lemma. The lemma being, essentially, if the first, you've got two sequences, if the first n plus 1 entries of the two sequences are the same, <coughs> then those sequences are going to be real close together. They're going to be within 1 over 2 to the end of each other, and vice versa. If you've got two sequences that are with 1 over 2 to the n of each other, then the first n plus 1 entries are the same. Essentially, the symmetric weights uh, terms at the beginning of the sequence more than terms in the tail that go on forever after, after a certain point. If two sequences match in their first, say, 10 terms, they're going to be pretty close to each other. They're going to be within 1 over 2 to the 10, 1 over 1024 of each other in this metric. They're going to be close together. If, on the other hand, the first 10 terms don't match, they're all different, say, and the last, well, infinity terms after that point do match, technically speaking, those sequences are relatively far apart, even though after the 10th term they all match. So it, it, it's getting more weight to the beginning terms. I, I've got the proof of the lemma here. You can use the lemma to prove sigma is continuous. That's, that proof is right here. I'm not going to take the time to go through it. You need to use the lemma here. I'm doing an epsilon delta argument there. Um, I could do it in terms of, terms of open balls if I wanted to. But it <coughs> seems simpler to use an epsilon delta argument in this case. Pretty interesting I'll, and, and not too hard. I think once you have that lemma, I think you could figure this one out. <coughs> Not terribly hard. What are some dynamic properties of the ship map? In other words, how does it behave under iteration? So we got this recursive equation. Careful, in that equation, xm and xm plus 1 are sequences. They're not terms of sequences. They are not numbers. Okay, if I'm writing that equation, maybe it's better not to write that equation. Um, under the shift map, a point, a point which is a sequence like this would be period n. Notice the pattern. x0, x1, x2, x3, etc. through xn minus 1. 
After n iterations of the shift map, where you delete the first term and shift everything to the left, essentially, you're going to be back where you started with the first term. And this pattern goes on forever, so this is going to repeat. The shift map, under the shift map, this is going to be a periodic point of period n. There's actually also going to be two to the n such sequences in the space, two to the n such points for any given n, because just basic arithmetic. Um, what do they call it? The fundamental paneling principle. For each of these, there's two choices, either a 0 or a 1. And there's n of them, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., through n, starting with 0. So you're going to have 2 to the n uh, such sequences. For any, for n equals 10, for example, there are 1,024, 2 to the 10th, distinct sequences of period 10 in this space. There are also infinitely many what you might call eventually periodic points where you eventually get a repeating pattern, but not at the start. <laughs> periodic points are dense in sigma 2. Now, I've mentioned density a little bit in this class. I haven't really focused on it. It's a topological concept. Basically, what this means is given any arbitrary point in the space, and an arbitrary epsilon, there's a, there's a periodic point within epsilon of that arbitrary point. Give me any point in the space. The periodic points are dense. They sort of are everywhere is the intuitive idea. So any epsilon, any little ball around that point is going to contain a point that's periodic. Proof's not too hard. I'll let you look, on, look at it on your own if you like. By the way, in doing this, I wanted to mention this at the beginning of class. I am maybe, if you do, are, if you are interested in this, this could be an idea for a Foundations of Math project, is to continue with what I'm doing here and, and prove things that I'm not going to prove. That could be a Foundations of Math project, both for you guys and for the future classes. If this interests you, if it doesn't, that's okay. It doesn't have to interest you. But I just, I, I, I want to praise God when I see all these things. I just want to... <coughs> I'm like, wow, God has given us the mind to understand this stuff. And also for this kind of phenomenon to occur, okay, to a mathematician, this is, when you first discover something like this, it's surprising. It's like, wow, I never knew this kind of behavior would occur. It's kind of like a scientist discovering something new. And our minds can understand it with enough work. Um, there also exists at least one point, actually more than one point, with an orbit that's dense. That's called topological transitivity. There's a point in the sequence space so that under iteration, you're going to get closer to any arbitrarily given point. One such point is this one. And I'm putting parentheses in there to indicate a pattern. These two numbers, these two numbers, 0 and 1, the symbol 0 is the symbol 1, are all the 1, um, how should I say it, all the things you can make with one symbol, either 0 or 1. That's not the best way to say that, perhaps. These eight digits, you should think of in groups of two, those are all the possible ways you can have two digits occur. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. There's four such groups of two digits. This one here, they're in groups of three. And mathematics even made it look like groups of three there. How about that? Zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero. It's kind of like coin tossing here I'm talking about. These are all the possible ways you can have zeros and ones in groups of three. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. This is groups of four. Mathematica didn't group it in four. Zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero. 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, et cetera. Those are all the groups of four zeros and ones, the ways you can do that. I didn't, I didn't include all of them. If you think about this sequence and go ahead and get rid of the parentheses, this sequence will get arbitrarily close to any given sequence. Because for any given sequence, say you want it to be within one over two to the end of that sequence, for any given sequence, Somewhere in this sequence is going to be the first n entries of your arbitrarily given n sequence. Or maybe I should say n plus 1 entries. 
somewhere in this sequence will be the first n plus 1 entries of your arbitrarily given sequence, meaning after that number of iterations of the shift map for this thing, you are within 1 over 2 to the n of the arbitrarily given sequence. Best I can say in 30 seconds. It also exhibits sensitive dependence on initial conditions. You change the initial conditions slightly, you're going to get a completely different long-term behavior. Basically, the idea here is, um, let's see what I say here. For an arbitrary epsilon, we can choose two points that are close together, within one over two to the end of each other, which say is less than epsilon, and is chosen so that that's true. Just make their first n plus one terms match. They're going to be within 1 over 2 to the n of each other then, and also within epsilon. And then after the n plus first term, however, make the terms that follow as different as you like. You can make them all different. And so what that's saying is the long-term behavior of the shift map under these two closed sequences is going to be completely different. That's sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So this is a, what you might call a toy model of chaos, okay? Um, toy in sort of the sense that it's seems kind of fake and is easy to play with, so to speak. It is still real math, okay? Metric spaces going on here, topological concepts. But as a model of chaos, you might think of it as a toy you can play with. It's relatively easy to understand in the big scheme of things. What about a real model of chaos? The dynamics of the logistic family? Okay, we're running a little time, gotta go fast. Um, okay, I guess I need to be side behind that section. Um, let me quickly go down and look at something else here. I've got stuff about the computer setting here. I'm not going to have time for all that, obviously. Um, what do I have here? Let's go back to the logistic maps. What we're going to look at here is something that's a little confusing, but is essential to understanding what's going on. What I've got here now is the first four iterates as functions graph. I think the red one is the is f. The blue one is f2, the second iterate that we graphed before in magenta. The green one I think is f3, and the yellow one is f4. I can look at the color to see if that's the case. And the line y equals x. I've also shaded the unit interval, this light blue color. As we increase mu, we can see what we saw before with, compare the red with the, uh, what will it be, the blue one. The red and the blue graphs we've seen before, I added more dots, I added dots, the corresponding x values here. The green and yellow graphs are new, though. They have the graphs of the third and fourth iteration. And at least with the fourth iteration, which is the um, yellow one, I'm not sure. I think it's the yellow one. The ye yellow one is going to go under some, undergo something similar that the blue one did. And it's going to cross the black line more. These one, two, three, four points are where the fourth iterate crosses y equals x beyond the period two points and the fixed points. And that corresponds to the period four point. The fourth iterate. The green one would correspond to a period three orbit, which would not occur under the period doubling, but it does eventually occur anyway. There are points of period three, actually two orbits of period three is what we're seeing here with the green intersects. Uh, there are six points, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's two orbits of period three there. We didn't really talk about period three before. <clears throat> actually, period three implies chaos, and that's the name of a famous paper, period three implies chaos. When you see a period three, there is chaotic behavior going on. We can put the iterations in here as well. You're also seeing shading. Hmm. Actually, we're not seeing the actual iterations. What this n increasing does is it changes the shading. We're past mu equals 4 here. 
here's the, we're getting close to the, the final conclusions about stuff here. We're past mu equals 4. When mu is bigger than 4, this graph goes above this box, and all points between these two points escape after one iteration, and, they, and then they end up going down to minus infinity. That's where the red graph is above the box. Those are the points that escape after one iteration. If I continue in increasing n here by one step, I'm creating new white spaces. These two white spaces can be the points that leave the box after two iterations. If you're in here, for example, go to the red graph, first go up there, then over to the black line, you're going to be here, you're going to leave the box after two iterations. Same kind of thing is going to happen over here. You go to the red graph, go to the black line, leave the box. They're also where the blue graph is, is outside the box, because the blue graph is the second iteration graph, the second iteration. See, it's above the box at those two intervals. If I go n equals 3, you get more white spaces. Uh, this one, of which is not graphed very well, it's supposed to go down all the way. And I think there's one here as well. You can see it. it's fairly white right up there. It's supposed to go down all the way, but Mathematica is not handling it so well. Those are the points that leave the box after three iterations. You can also notice the green graph is above the uh, line there on those intervals, like right there, for example. If you start here, you're going to leave the box after three iterations. Watch my finger here. One iteration, two iterations, three, and you leave the box. There's, you can keep going with n. You can try to find the points that leave after four iterations. Mathematica is not really okay. Try to graph it here. The new ones, for example, this white space, are where the yellow graph, the fourth iterator, is above the box, right there. And those points leave the box after four iterations. The parts that are not white, the parts that are still shaded, are the points that don't leave within four iterations. You can continue this process forever. You keep continuing to take out sets from the set of points that don't leave, what you're left with, after infinitely many steps here, is the set of points that don't ever leave the box after iteration. You have what's called an invariant Cantor set. It's not the Cantor set that I talked about a month or two ago. It's similar. We're about out of time. Uh, let me just say, you can define the invariant Cantor set. This is a capital lambda there. That's one of my book's notations for this invariant Cantor set. And you can ultimately translate between the invariant Cantor set and the symbol space through what's called a topological conjugacy. A continuous and a one-to-one correspondence that's continuous and has continuous inverse that translates the behavior of points in the symbol space with respect to the shift map and their behavior, like periodic behavior, for example, into the exact same behavior for f on the invariant Cantor set. I describe how that's done. I mention this is actually analogous to something in linear algebra. When you're talking about similar matrices, uh, similar matrices have similar properties, like the same eigenvalues, for example. That came up in diagonalization in linear algebra. And that essentially says the linear transformations corresponding to those matrices are basically the same, except for a change of coordinates. And it's a similar idea here. H translates between these two spaces and these two maps. And the symbol space is easy to analyze, and through this conjugacy, you can prove the exact same thing about the original function. You can prove chaos. You can prove all those properties. Periodic points are dense, for example, in the original real model. Okay? We're out of time, so I had to go real quick there at the end. I'll put this on Moodle, and you can look at it. <laughs>